Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, the honor of joining your circle today. Um, it's not often I uh, sit among the fiercest warriors uh, that uh, the crown had ever had to deal with. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to address some of what was I heard this morning, um, but first I want to put this to you. Really, what is your starting position? Before anything else, there's a big decision to be made. Um, and I want to be clear. I speak about nations and sovereignty and how to enforce and use treaties. I am, I'm the one that pointed out the agenda uh, for Canadian governments in terms of turning you into domestic ethnic minorities, uh, Indigenous Canadians. Um, and it really is a matter of deciding, or, you know, are you going to, are you going to continue as your ancestors did following your original instructions? Or are you going to cut that chain, cut that link? Are you going to agree that your ancestors were just beasts of the field as the doctrine of discovery says? Uh, or, and then go for what the Dominion of Canada governments want you to be. You know, they've always been really choked that they didn't get what they wanted. And ever since the time of treaty, you have been pushed and starved and oppressed to try to get you to give up, to abandon. I'm here to say, you don't have to do it that way. You don't have to do that. The foundation is here, the, the so-called reconciliation, um, how to share together is already set out. But unfortunately, as was mentioned yesterday, there's been interruptions. The residential school is a big one. Uh, the other was lawyers not being able to act for you because of uh, threat of prison, even accepting money to, to help and to write anything. But I want to, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And but it's so that you can understand what I'm speaking about is not some theory. It's not some, oh, this could be the best way to go. It's not like, oh, here's the solution to the problem that I have dreamed up and I'm going to convince you to follow me to do. Um, you know, the Western approach is very much a competition of, no, follow me. You know, no, follow me. No, I have the answer. It's important to understand that it's the process that matters the most. When people are part of the circle and coming there from a good place, ready to give, not coming in to take, to make their millions off the backs of your suffering. When you have a process that is respectful of your laws and who you are, there are good outcomes. But if you have people coming into that who are, as I said, just interested in their self-profit, um, the outcomes aren't going to work. So this concept of who should I follow? Who makes the most sense? Who do I think knows more? That's not the process. First, decide who are you and know what you have. Then understand fully what treaties allow you to do, what your laws allow you to do. And then understand the agenda the genocidal agenda that has placed you in this position where individuals are acting to, well, at least I'll make something, at least my family will be provided for. You know, the, the concept of 500 years you know, later doesn't matter. You know, the, uh, you know, I just have to worry about what I can get right now. Um, some of these individuals actually think, well, they'll be respected and seen as white. Um, but once their usefulness is done, 
then they may have some short-term income, but they will never have that respect. The laughing, the what I have witnessed that I cannot necessarily share um, is not a fate I would wish on anyone. Now, what am I talking about? With me, I'm in a very unique position. There was talk that, well, your, your understanding of your laws and, and such were interrupted very seriously with residential schools, but not for me. And let me explain this. There were now ancestors who visited your ancestors who were present at treaty. And it, sorry, the ancestors that we're visiting were from uh, Coastal Salish as a, as, young, as a young man, particularly Chief Notlacha, kind heart. As a younger man was educated, thoroughly educated by your ancestors about treaty. Why was this important? Because the treaty making hadn't continued on the West Coast. British Columbia, said, we don't really have to do this. We don't want to do this. We don't have money for this. We're just going to keep taking and asserting sovereignty as it's come to be known. So he was there to understand what, and this is well before BC treaty process and things like that, land claims, all that. So he went there to really understand what went down. What are these treaties? What happened? He takes that knowledge back to his people, West, uh, the coastal Salishan and interior Salishan. And that's where I've been, I was born and raised uh, in their territory in Greater Vancouver. That information then was given to me. I thought it odd, my being, how I appear, my background. But I've come in more recent years to really understand and to really believe what I was told that uh, and this is a lot of interior Salish and elders, especially who did the same thing in terms of bringing me into their laws, to their governance. I witnessed, I have witnessed and seen, I've not just read in textbooks that, oh yeah, you may have done that. And I don't talk past tense. Yesterday's speaker, always talking past tense. You're here, you're alive, the nations are functioning. Yes, severely oppressed. Yes, that's severely unlawful, etc. But I've seen it with my own eyes. I have sat in places on the Indigenous nation side where clearly younger people were distressed to see me entering. <laughs> like, what is she doing there, right? Um, and being literally held, sometimes held off, right, by those that say, no, don't you question. And I have seen where most members, most uh, of, of the families in the nation don't are not part of, because this is the executive, if you will, um, dealing with other, their obligations and, and, and such, their economy, their economic sovereignty. So all that information that was transferred from you, your ancestors, off to the West, then comes into me. So there's an unbroken uh, channel there because of course I didn't go to residential school. And again, it was like, well, our people aren't ready to carry this. We need someone who will know when to share these things, when they're needed, when to sound the alarm, when to be our voice when we can't physically be there, but we will always be with you. So that's on your side of things. Now let's take the other side on terms of Canadian governments. Well, I was in house Department of Justice Legal Counsel for Indian Affairs, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, as it was then known. And before that, I was Revenue Canada Taxation, Customs and Excise uh, Legal Counsel. So moving into a field being asked uh, to move over in, in, in an area I knew nothing about, but I'm I've, this is hard to speak of myself, but I've, I have a very good, keen legal mind. But I, and I never, I had a, a lesson in law school where the dean of the law school called me in after the first exam taken 
And he asked me why I discontinued a line of thought that I had uh, set out in my exam paper. And I said, well, I realized you hadn't taught that because I was very much, you know, before law school, I never had to study. Um, I said, you didn't teach that. And he says, well, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you didn't teach it. So I, you know, I will, you dish back what you're taught to get the good grades, right? <laughs> so he says, well, tell me now what you were thinking. And so I explained how I disagreed with a finding of, of a case, et cetera. Long story, um, I fully set out my analysis and such. And he sat me down and he says, if you would have, and I'd only, by the way, I'd only gotten a C. I'd never had a C in my life, except for Jim. Jim, I got a D once. I'm not... <laughs> Even though I like team sports, uh, uh, gymnastics, not for me. Uh, so anyhow, he said, you know, if you had set that out, I would have given you an A. Uh, and he said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to ask you a question now. He says, are you going to be a lawyer? And I said, yeah, obviously. I wanted to be one since I was like five. And he said, well, you got to decide now. We don't need any more of these people that just fill in the blanks. Those are not real lawyers. We need lawyers who are going to um, correct the law when it's out of line, because we have a system in law that's based on precedent. So one judge decides something, the next judge is bound to decide the same way, and it goes and goes and goes. Unfortunately, that can leave the law really off track. That's happened with Section 35, which I will get into later. And so he says, it's your responsibility. If you're going to be a real lawyer, then you need to know that you have every right to, to make statements on the law, to correct the legal analysis, even if it's a Supreme Court of Canada judge that's wrong. Because, you know, as law students, we sort of look at judges as gods almost, especially Supreme Court of Canada uh, judges, justices. And so it was a, a really pointed time in my legal career where I took it on, I made the decision, I made that commitment to the dean that, yes, I will become a real lawyer. Now, when I joined the Department of Justice, keep in mind, I have a bachelor, a five-year, which Bachelor of Commerce degree, which is now equivalent to a, a Master of Business Administration. So business was my first career, if you will, management consultant for uh, global companies. And I um, always wanted to be a lawyer, though, so went back to law school. I, I basically wrote the LSAT the night before leaving for Hawaii after I graduated with my Bachelor of Commerce. And my attitude was, I'm not studying, I'm not preparing, I'm going to write this cold. I don't even know what the exams look like, because if this is meant to be, then I'll do well. And if not, then I've got lots of other opportunities available to me. Well, I ended up placing in the top 4% of the um, exams written that year. And so to me, that was like, okay, you know, even though I'm going to work for a couple of years as a management consultant, because in that capacity, I was able to meet, uh, cold call, get into the top five people, top five executive positions in large corporations, I thought that was good experience for me. But then went back to law school and after law school went into private practice and eventually um, joined the Department of Justice. So while I'm there and while I am trying to, um, I'm keen, like I said, I'm not just going to repeat and do as told. I need to know I'm doing the best job. I need to know the law. I need to know what I'm doing. Well, Department of Justice, I have access to everything. I can't tell you what I've read there, what I've seen there. But I can tell you it's an unbroken chain as well in terms of this situation that we have in this part of the world. And I've sat at the war tables. I can't tell you what I said when I heard some of the things I said. I can't tell you my reactions. Um, I also can't tell you why I found so many lawyers that were supposed to be acting for Benz, really not doing the protection and the job that I felt was possible. And one of those lawyers was really the... Um, the last straw, you know, that broke the camel's back, so to speak, that said, now it is time for me to get out there. And my intention was to train lawyers 
so they would know who their clients are, how to protect them, what their clients have, and not just settle for you know whatever might be coming their way. And Jack Woodward was really that lawyer that made me finally, a number of lawyers before him, but made me finally uh, decide it was time. And it was because there's a scenario involving serious, serious health issues for a band. And he was bragging about how he had gotten this great settlement. But all he had really gotten was what they were already entitled to. There was nothing for the wrongdoing. Now, being in an adversarial situation at that point, there was nothing I could do. Um, uh, you, you know, my client is opposite and, you know, but reading and dealing with that, it was something I could, it just couldn't stomach, right? Um, and yet, you know, the lawyers making millions and millions of dollars, but the poor people who whose health needed to be addressed, who needed help for, to alleviate the suffering, what was there for them, right? So after that, I went in-house, I, I fell for this, hey, self-government, it's going to be great, you know? Uh, and I went in-house with a, an Indian band, first lawyer to do so in Canada. And boy, I learned a lot there too. And I quickly realized that at the same time I'm being educated by um, the elders and you know, being the first white person to be told about what went down in the residential schools, horrendous. I still have nightmares. Um, that it's the people who really need the help. And through this process of me applying my knowledge that of, of how uh, the people are represented, at, you know, for instance, petitions would go into the Crown, that would trigger Department of Justice to act, things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, as I applied those very same processes, only on the other side, so to speak, uh, how to trigger the fiduciary duty, law societies determined and decided, you know, they're self-governing, that no, no, hang on, we can't have lawyers doing what Swallow is doing. Therefore, we declare that a band can only be represented by chief and counsel, and the lawyer can only take instructions from the chief and counsel. That's how the band, quote unquote, gets represented. Well, I don't know anyone really who hasn't seen conflicts of interest in situations where essentially band members, members, nationals don't have access to justice. They, they really don't. Um, so I tested the waters while I was still practicing law in BC. I was the first lawyer to say, no, I'm not using this section 35 stuff because it's, I, I can see what it is. Okay. And, whoa, that got everyone really upset. No, you have to go under Section 35. It's like, no, hold on. I'm going to represent my clients as best I can. And they're nations. I know they're nations. So I'm not going to go under and say they're domestic ethnic minorities, things like that. So, you know, what comes after that? You know, lots of uh, either pressures, threats, death threats, $100 million if you go away and on a, retire on a, an island, you know, things like that. Well, the more that stuff starts happening, the more I realize I'm really onto something and the more I dig and the more I do research and the more my knowledge increases and the more the ancestors help. Because why? I care. I understand those basic laws of loving, caring, sharing. So understanding things from both perspectives with no disconnects. Remember that the lawyers, when they were told you cannot do this. Well, there's no, the senior lawyers who at that time would know everything I know now and have known, um, there's no incentive to teach the younger lawyers because that's basically how law, the practice of law happens. It's not law school. It's through learning from what the senior lawyers do, the practice of law. So the, the lawyers were no longer 
having that information shared. Why? Well, because you're not going to be able to use it. You're not going to be able to have Indigenous clients. Then when it starts back up, you end up having this development of Aboriginal law. It's new law. It's only really coming into effect in the 1990s. And it says as a result of Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. So you, this is when you have this option, if you will, to move into an assimilated um, structure and entity and again, you know, cut off. Um, and since the people, you know, the decision makers, since the people have always, quite frankly, whether it was enfranchisement, whether it was whatever was proposed, the people always protected as a, as a whole. It, very hard to get something past the people. And remember that when, for instance, developments on reserve are happening, it was the Department of Justice lawyer's duty, the fiduciary duty to make sure that what was being proposed is in the best interests of the people as a whole, the band as a whole, the members, not a couple of people. And I can't tell you how many things came past my desk that I said, no freaking way. It was clear that the chief was going to get all the money uh, or a chief and counselor, a couple of people like no, that's not in the best interest of the people. That protection has also been removed now by Canadian government policy. So, and I don't want to get into this too much, but bottom line, before uh, Department of Justice lawyers could basically say, no, hold up, you can't do that. Government policy now is, we don't want to hear from you. We don't, we can we will not receive any opinions from you or directions from you unless we specifically ask you for it. So clamping down and locking down and, and shutting up the, the Department of Justice lawyers. So that's why we have today a whole bunch of stuff going on. Well, I'm um, going to tell you this one. Um, that in my, uh, I'll, I'll say dream, okay? It's, it's different than a dream though. I was shown how all these small soldiers, all looking the same, were just pouring through the prairie and going down even towards into the States. But I was standing there on the mountain, on the mountains, your, your mountains. I was standing there and as they went by, and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be killed, right? This army is, this army is gonna kill me. And they looked Asian, right? The Chinese. I'm going to be killed. But as they came past me, they nodded. I'm like, what? Then I looked around. And guess who was standing all behind me? There's all these real chiefs, real leaders, the many leaders. You know, that's your, your name, isn't it? Many, many chiefs, many, many leaders. They were all standing there behind me. We were all up on this hill watching. and. They were not nodding to me. They were nodding to you. Um, and that is absolutely consistent with preserving your nationhood, preserving those treaties, and not coming under Canada. If you're under Canada that way, you're there where they're running over top. How do you know what the political situation is going to be in the future? In the far past, you didn't but you're still here today. And your ancestors were able to, to get a commitment from the crown to recognize who you are. And you know, where, do you, where do you go you know, from, from there? So right. that's not how it, it's done. And unfortunately, no one's really making, no one's making these demands to say, you know, like for instance, like, Talking about, oh, was it the, the chief there? Oh, we need capital partners. What? Like, <laughs> if there's going to be development that happens, no matter what Canada and the provinces are, are saying to companies coming in, they can say, hey, I'm taxing you and whatever. But that's not your concern. Your concern is this is use of your land and they need your consent, not consultation the people's consent 
in order to provide direct permissions to say, okay, you can do this. But guess what? You can have conditions linked to that. We will allow you to mine here, but not there. And you will be required to deposit this as a, a surety to make sure damage is, is, is contained. And you will abide by these particular environmental controls. You know, there was a lot of emphasis yesterday by a lawyer saying, oh, you know, um, your way is a good way. And if you can influence policy, then uh, blah, blah, blah. Why give up control? You have the direct ability to insist that if you want our permissions, this is how you have to do it. And here's what you need to pay us. So why do you need uh, partners to enforce treaty and enforce your law? The law of the land, it's trite to say it's where the land is. That has not been killed off. You, it can't be. The crown and, and her governments, his governments, cannot do that. The only way it happens is if you give it up, you give it away, you hand it off, you leave it by the side of the road. I can't recommend that. Quite frankly, you would have no issues with, you know, drug treatment requirements, uh, housing, um, all that, you know, that sad story about sitting on the side of the road drinking Lysol. Do you see, have you see what's happened in Dubai and places like that? The people aren't trying to get menial labor jobs. They're benefiting, and I can't comment as to the, you know, how fairly or not, but bottom line, you know, you don't you don't see Sikhs saying. Give, give my people jobs. They say, give us this amount of money. They say, give us this share off the top, bef you know, before expenses, you pay us first, these kinds of things. That's all within your control, but you don't believe it. People have been taught that's not possible. Well, why? Well, because, you know, they're Indians. They're, they're just like, you know, <laughs> And the solution suggested to you is to hand, not is to abandon it, but instead of just leaving it beside the road, just to literally hand it over to Canadian governments, um, including now provincial governments. Uh, you know, so my view of the future, 500 years from now, if you decide to become a domestic ethnic minority today, I don't anticipate. 500 years from now, uh, many will be walking around for the kinds of things that were described. Um, are we still good to go or, or, or do people need a, a five minute break? I'm good, Janice. Okay, great. How about uh, you, Roger? We're good to go. Okay, <laughs> I'll keep moving along in this disjointed manner. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Janet, could you repeat the last uh, words before you, uh, you stopped? About the future? Oh, yeah, I'm just saying, if, if you decide today to become this domestic ethnic minority, if you go along with things being signed by people that don't have the ability to sign you away, but you just go, oh, well, what am I going to do about it? I, I, how, did, how was that put? Um, oh, never mind. This is not an, oh, never mind. Did your, your reputation as fierce warriors, they never said, oh, never mind, right? That's something new. That's not in your blood. And what's in your blood is supposed to be protecting for these next, each 500 segment that's to come. How many have you had before? relying on who you are, the instructions, original instructions, developing your laws on that basis, not saying and giving up. And when you say things like, oh, we're trying to get it back, then you've said you've lost it. And once it's gone, it's gone. It's all about saying, no, you've got this wrong. We're not falling for this position that Canada keeps teaching. And, and saying, 
Just because they say it doesn't make it right. But if you believe it and you act consistent with it over enough period of time, long enough, then you will become that, whether something's signed or not. And every little document for every little thing, whether, you know, incrementally, this is the approach now, not one big thing, incrementally, all of that stacks up as evidence to say, yeah, this is how you saw yourselves. At some point between 2018 and 2030, this is when they're gone. This is where you're going. But they can have a big stack like this of, of documents <laughs> and, and each one being that size. You can take two paragraphs to say, nope, not so. That's not true. We're here. We still have this. How do I know that? Because I've also done that and tested the waters and dealt with the queen directly to remind of just that, of the things that can't be done. Recall last year that in less than one month's notice, Prince of Wales, now King Charles III, suddenly is making a visit to Canada. And suddenly having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the governor general and a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Do you know how long it takes for royal visits to be set up, security, everything that has to happen, especially in the Jubilee year? This was not planned. This was a sudden work, I'm coming. What triggered that? What made the queen, because of course her health situation, she wasn't able to do it herself. And what made the queen say, this is happening? It's one of my letters. It's one of my saying, you can't do this. This is what your unlawful governments are doing. And <laughs> so you see it happening. But then you, of course, it's always a double-edged sword, as they say. When I reveal information, when I informed, Canadian governments can act, react quickly and then take a next step in terms of their strategy. Not, hasn't been the case so far as much with um, Indigenous nations. There are, there are many, of course, that I've been helping and such, but unfortunately, there are a few people who dominate as, as advisors who are just using the same old toolkit. Uh, just like what we heard about yesterday, um, well, the only way to really do this, I see this vision of you're going to have a separate parliament. Oh my God, right? Pan Indianism, pan whatever, right? Pan Aboriginal, all part of the, you know, and, and they're talking about Indigenous peoples being part of that. I guess you're going to have Metis and Inuit in there too. Um, I don't deal with them because they're not nations. Inuit capitulated, they entered into a final land claim agreement. Metis, whole other situation. Um, you know, they're not a standalone nation. They can never enter into a treaty. They can enter into land claim settlements, but not a treaty. So I work with nations preserving their sovereignty, their jurisdiction, and their treaties. And you know what? It doesn't take multiple millions of dollars. It takes a few paragraphs. It takes two pages sometimes. You know, in one case, with the Six Nations back in 2006, it took one paragraph to get the then Prince of Wales, Charles, uh, to call off the army in Canada in the middle of the night, right? So there's so much of this kind of stuff. I'm not here speculating, thinking. I'm saying relying on the fact of you continuing as nations, relying on the recognition of you as nations and as sovereign and as international players and entities, and reminding the crown, here's what you're bound by, and here's what your governments can't do. There have been immediate reactions, not years of lawsuits and paying lawyers. Do you know what these lawyers are saying about you? There, there are basically three uh, attack uh, situations happening right now, and it's critical. This is really critical. They're saying things like, in because lawyers will draft a statement of claim which sets out the facts that they say exist 
in the statement of claims for the annuities um, losses, the Robinson Huron 1850 treaty annuities case, and we have one person, there's a couple of people, a few people in that one. Then we have one person in treaty one who has obtained a representation order saying, and both these lawsuits say this, there are no more nations, they're gone. The only thing that exists are Indian bands, Indian Act bands. And they're saying thing, crazy things like they're the successor. You read the treaties, the only place it says a successor is as I mentioned for the king and the queen. In other words, just because the queen dies and we now have a king didn't mean the treaties fell. The crown remains bound. And the crown in, in their interests um, their permissions are remain in place. So, and I just, you know, sorry, because I get upset when I um, hear so much literally nonsense that when you say that's not good enough for us, we want Canada to create those things for us. We want to be a new legal entity created by Canada. There are consequences and, you know, it's starting to happen. If you look up north, KFN, uh, they got burned out, the banned office, burned down, everything, wildfires, just taking them all out. If you look at Misikyu, which is a Woodward uh, case, they developed this concept of duty to consult within the Section 35 doctrine. They're evacuated right now. These things are happening. But like up north, um, the people that I was helping living right across the river from KFN, they're fine. Their people relying on their laws and the power, the powers that they know still how to use kept that fire at bay. Yes, there's firefighters and things like that, but um, you can't ignore the power of your actual laws and what can be done. Um, so that was the one thing. The fact is that with treaties, the crown has recognized your ownership, your underlying title, your original, your continuing ownership. And I'm going to get into some of the details of that. So I completely disagree with that comment that, oh, you have to do it this way. And that's the only way you'll own you know, you got to go get it back. You have it. You still have it. It's all about whether you're going to give it away, whether you're going to abandon it. That's what's in play. Not that it's been taken. Um, it doesn't exist. You have to create it. You have to go get sovereignty. <laughs> you have sovereignty. If you abandon it, if you lose it, it's gone. If you, there's a concept called raise nullius which means no one's property. If you were to leave and drop, leave on the road, if you will, um, your bundle, which is your, you know, who you are, your laws, your land, all that, and leave it behind and say, I don't, we don't need this. Canada is going to set us up nice. You know, we're going to do what we want Canada to create us now. Well, the crown can lawfully under raise nullius, a doctrine, pick up these lands, right? Because it's no one's property at that point. And the next in line, because of treaties especially, the next in line is the crown. And then because the crown is a constitutional monarchy, the Canadian governments can control all that because the constitutional monarch, the king must act on the advice of his privy council members, which is the prime minister, elected ministers, et cetera. So let's launch into how is that different than what it actually exists? Obviously Canada, that's what Canada wants. They wanna control everything. They don't want this pesky problem that they don't actually own the land. They have an interest. Um, sorry. Yeah, questions at the end. I'm gonna be going all over the place here, right? It's not a linear uh, presentation and I'm not apologizing for that. Um, that's just the way, the way things are. 
now here the other um before I forget that second comment that I disagreed with so strongly that NRTA is ripe for challenge as an unconstitutional amendment to the treaties. There is no government of Canada, the Dominion of Canada that has any power whatsoever to amend any treaty. Land claims maybe, but tr not treaties, not treaty seven, uh, for example. Are there issues around NRTA? Yes but not the way these lawyers who want you to get either to do specific claims or file litigation. Again, multiple, multiple millions of dollars in their pocket. How is that really going to benefit you when you're then saying and giving this power that doesn't exist to Canadian governments? 